on Facebook now. Okay, one second, and we'll be ready to go. Okay, I think we are just about ready. All right, maybe I'll pick an appropriate background for today. Give me one second. This is nice. This is my house. All right. That's a good background. All right. So we'll start. We'll start chanting Jai Radha Madhava. I think we're ready. Yeah. Jai Radha Madhava. Kunda Bihari. Jai Hurad Umad Huba Kunya Bihari Gopi Jana Malaba Kiri Bharat Ahuti Gopi <coughs> Jana Malaba Kiri Bharat Ahuti Yashoda Nandana Maraja Jana Ranjana Yashoda Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana Yamuna Tira Manachari Yamuna Tira Manachari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunda Bihari Radha Madhova Kunya Bihari Gopi Jana Malaba Kiri Bharati Gopi Jana Malaba Kiri Bharati Yashoda Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana so the nanana braja jana ranjana yamuna tira banachari yamuna tira banachari jaya ran umadhava kunja bihari Radha Madhova Kunja Bihari Jai Om Vishnupad Paramahamsa Paravidakacharya Also Tara Sutashi Shimad His Divine Grace Sabaya Chanana the Bhaktivedanta Goswami Shila Prabhupad Ki Jai Iskan Founder Acharya Shila Prabhupad Ki Jai Anantakoti Vaishna Vrinda Gajai Namacharya Shadahi Rastakur Gajai Prem Say Kaho Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nichananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shiva Siddhi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Gajai Shri Shri Radhakrishna Gopi Gopinath Shayam Kun Radhakunda Giri Gopar Dhan Gajai Vrindavanam Gajai Maturam Gajai Jagadam Sami Gajai Yamunamai Kajai, Shimani Lassi Devi Kajai, Samaveda Bhakta, Vrindi Kajai, Gaur Prevalanda, Hari 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 Hari. All glories to the assembled devotees, all glories to the assembled devotees, all glories to the assembled devotees, all glories to Shi, Guru and Gauranga, Srila Prabhupada Kajai. Namaom Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Pristaya, Bhutale Shimati Bhakti Vedanta Swamini Namani 
Namaste Saraswati Devi Gorvati Charity Divasesha Shunyavati Paschacha Deja Tarane. So, Omagana Timiranda Shah Gananjana Gananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shi Gurveda Maha. I offer my respectful obeisances unto the lotus feet of my spiritual master. His divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada, who so kindly opened my eyes for the torchlight of knowledge while I was blinded in the darkness of ignorance. Okay, so we're going to continue with our nectar devotion study. And as we always do, we're going to chant this shloka from the Goswami Ashtaka before we begin. Mm. Excuse me, I got a little hiccups here. Uh, Nana Shastra Vicharanai Kandipa no Sadharma Samstapako Lokanam Hitakarano Tri Bhuvane Manyo Chadanya Karu Radha Krishna Padaravinda Bhajana Nandena Maktali Kohu Vande Rupa Sanatano Ragu Yago Shi Jiva Gopala Kohu I offer my respectful obeisances unto the six Goswamis of Vrindavan, namely Sri Sanatana Goswami, Sri Rupa Goswami, Sri Raghunath Bhatta Goswami, Mm. Sri Vaganath Das Goswami, Sri Jiva Goswami, and Sri Gopal Bhatta Goswami, who are very expert in scrutinizingly studying all the revealed scriptures with the aim of establishing eternal religious principles for the benefit of all human beings. Thus they are honored all over the three worlds, and they are worth taking shelter of because they are absorbed in the mood of the gopis and are engaged in the transcendental loving service of Radha and Krishna. Okay, so now we're ready to go to the Nectar Devotion. We're hearing about the qualities of Sri Krishna. And remember, when we talk about the qualities of Sri Krishna, these are the Bhavas. And I'm going to describe what a Vibhava is again for the umpteenth time. Here we go. A Vibhava is something that's stimulates your ecstasy or emotions, okay? It stimulates your emotions or ecstasies, or even it stimulates your misery. <laughs> anyway, all types of emotions are stimulated by something called a vibhava. In the material world, we have vibhavas too. Like when my mother sees a picture of me, she becomes ecstatic. <laughs> That picture is a vibhava. All right? So when we hear about Krishna or Krishna's qualities, then that stimulates our ecstasy. So the number there is directly Krishna and things related to Krishna, like his qualities. Okay. So now we're going to hear about Krishna's being a pleasing talker. A person who can speak sweetly even with his enemy, just to pacify him, is called a pleasing talker. Krishna was such a pleasing talker that after defeating his enemy Kaliya in the water of the Yamuna, he said, My dear king of snakes, although I have given you so much pain, please do not be dissatisfied with me. It is my duty to protect these cows which are worshipped even by the demigods. Only in order to save them from the danger of your presence, have I been obliged to banish you from this place? So Krishna is basically, you know, I'm sorry I did this. Please excuse me, but it's my duty. Kali was residing within the water of the Yamuna, and as a result, the back portion of that river had become poisoned. Thus so many cows who had drunk the water had died. Therefore, Krishna, even though he was only four or five years old, dipped himself into the water, punished Kaliya very severely, and then asked him to leave that place and go elsewhere. Hmm. So let me explain something about Kaliya. 
uh, Talia, I guess I should tell the whole story, you know, why not? So, uh, Kalia had taken shelter in the Yamuna River. And the reason he had taken shelter in the Yamuna River because his enemy was Garuda, the bird carrier of the Supreme Personality of God. So, Garuda is a great pure devotee. However, his prasadam is different than our prasadam. Our prasadam is basically, you know, leaves, fruit, a little water, vegetarian stuff. And Garuda, he's allowed to eat everything except for Brahmins. Even some human beings he can eat. Because he's so big. He is the original big bird. Okay. So Garuda, he was going hither and thither and eating fish at this particular juncture. And things that were in the water, you know, other things, like water snakes and everything like that. So, anyway, so he came to the Yumuna, and he saw so many nice fish there. And he was warned by one sage who was meditating there, please do not touch my fish. The sage's name was Shobri Muni. And Garuda, he didn't pay him attention. He just made off with the biggest fish and ate the fish. And Shobari Muni cursed him that if you ever come to this place again, you will die. And so Garuda wasn't so worried about the curse because, you know, he's Krishna's carrier. But to honor the sage, he decided never to go to that place in Yamuna again. Okay. So, there's this serpent with many, many heads. His name is Kaliya. And he was looking for a safe place to go because he was worried about Garuda. Previously, he was living in Fiji. Nice place. Probably better weather. So, <laughs> probably one of the best places for weather in the world. So anyway, so he's thought, for a second, where can I go where Garuda can't harass me? Because no other animal can harass me. I'm, you know, the big snake, the biggest snake ever, and I got many hoods, and so nobody's going to bother me except for that Garuda person. So he thought, well, Garuda is not going to go to the Yamuna. So he and his wives, because snakes are married sometimes, so these are celestial snakes, so they can change their form. Uh, they can look like human beings, they could look like mermaids or merman or whatever. And so they all swam to the Yamuna and made their home there and they were very, very happy. However, getting back to the sage, Shobri Muni, who had cursed Garuda, this sage had just committed a mad elephant offense. That means he offended a great devotee of the Lord. Imagine cursing a great devotee of the Lord. So what happened is that this sage developed material desires. He uh, saw some fish getting married, a fish ever get married. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, fish were engaged in fishy business, whatever that is, the birds and the bees, but you can't say that about fish. So the fish were engaged in whatever, and they were having little baby fish, fishitos. And so he thought, ah, why am I meditating? You know, I can just enjoy life. So he went to the king, the king's name was Maharaj Mandata, and he said to the king, can I marry one of your daughters? And the king looked at the sage, and the sage has been meditating in the water for so many years, and he was quite waterlogged. His skin was all wrinkly, ooh. And he thought, you know, I'm not going to do this to any of my daughters. So he said, but he didn't want to offend the king, so he said to the, uh, uh, he didn't want to offend the sage, sorry. King didn't want to offend the sage. So the, so the king said to the sage, all right, here's a way I can get out of this. Any one of my daughters can marry you who wants to. So the sage, he understood the king's trick. So using his mystic powers, he transformed himself into the most attractive young man with big muscles. And so he walked into a place where the women were, and he said, uh, who wants to marry me? And there were 50 of them, and they all said, 
you will be my husband. He's mine. He's mine. He's mine. He's mine. He's mine. He's mine. And they fought over him, and he got married. Later on, he realized that uh, his material desire, nothing wrong with getting married, but his material desires came about or reared their ugly heads because, why? Because of his offense against Vaishnav. Anyway, getting back to the Yamuna River, so the Kali is there, enjoying life, thinking he's all right, nobody's going to bother him. But because he's such a poisonous snake, all the different creatures who lived, and including the trees and plants and everything like that, who lived close to the Yamuna River, even those who breathed the air that came from the Yamuna River, died. So Krishna decided, let me solve this problem. Some cows died. Krishna jumped into the Yamuna River and trampled on the heads of this Kaliya serpent, making him surrender. And while he was trampling on the heads of the Kaliya serpent, that is dancing, I wouldn't say trampling exactly, he was dancing on the heads of the Kaliya serpent, he left the imprint of his feet on the heads of the Kaliya serpent. So he told the Kaliya serpent after he finished dancing and after the Kaliya serpent apologized and after the Kaliya serpent's wives, the Nagapadnis, interceded on behalf of their husband, that Garuda will not bother you anymore. Just get out of here. Garuda won't bother you anymore because your, my footprints are on your heads. So go back to Fiji. And so Kaliya swam back with his wives to Fiji. So that's the story of Kaliya. Krishna said at that time that the cows are worshipped even by the demigods. And he practically demonstrated how to protect the cows. At least people who are in Krishna consciousness should follow in his footsteps and give all protection to the cows. Cows are worshipped not only by the demigods. Krishna himself worshipped the cows on several occasions, especially on the days of Gopashtami and Govardhana Puja. So, Protection of the cows is a very serious business. It's, if you or someone decides to have cows, it's like having a child. That's it. That's your service for the whole life of the cow and the whole life of all the cow's offsprings. In other words, the rest of your life, you are tied down. Remember that. That's it. And you have to be careful not to breed the cows too much. It's very serious. In Iskand, there have been so many devotees who have taken cows and made a lot of mistakes, overbred the cows, not take care of them. Sometimes, anyway, the cows were taken away and slaughtered. It's just very serious. Devotees sometimes are very sentimental about cows. They look at the cows and say, oh, how beautiful. But they don't understand the rest of your life. You're like that. I mean, it's even more serious than marriage. You can't get divorced from a cow. You can't go to the uh, courts and declare yourself free from taking care of a cow. It's for the rest of your life. It's not like having a cat or a dog. You know, people get so damn sentimental about it. Anyway, as you can tell, we're dealing with one particular situation. In a farm somewhere in the United States, where people are not thinking clearly and they're getting themselves in trouble and we're not going to take responsibility for it for someone else's foolishness. And so, next one. Fluent. A person who can speak meaningful words with all politeness and good qualities is called Vavadruka, or fluent. There's a nice statement in Srimad Bhagavatam regarding Krishna speaking politely. When Krishna politely bade his father, Nanda Maharaj, to stop the ritualistic offering of sacrifice to the rain god Indra, a wife of one village coward man became captivated. Let me turn up this film. Here he goes. This is. Uh, became captivated. She later thus described the speaking of Krishna to her friends. Krishna was speaking to his father so politely and gently that it was as if he were pouring nectar into the ears of all present there. After hearing such sweet words from Krishna, who will not be attracted to him? Hmm. Krishna's speech, which contains all good qualities in the universe, is described in the following statement by Uddhava. The words of Krishna are so attractive 
that they can immediately change the heart of even his opponent. His words can immediately solve all of the questions and problems of the world. Although he does not speak very long, each and every word from his mouth contains volumes of meaning. These features of Krishna are very pleasing to my heart. Wow. Highly learned. When a person is highly educated and acts strictly on moral principles, he is called highly learned. A person conversant in different departments of knowledge is called educated. And because he acts on moral principles, he is called morally stout. Together, these two factors constitute learning. In other words, there's action and knowledge. And so we have this word, acharya. So an acharya is someone who acts nicely and speaks nicely. Actually, there's two words. One word is prachar. That means you teachings. And there's achar, which means your example or your actions. So as Krishna says in the Gita, what? Yad yad acharyati shreshtas tatat eve turo chanaha. As great people or people who set examples act, other people follow. And we've seen that today in the political situation in the United States. That, you know, people in a high position, they act in a certain way, even if it's a nasty, creepy way, then their followers follow. Therefore, people should not be in a high position unless they have these two qualities. They're highly learned and they act on moral principles. Now, what are moral principles? Oh my God. These are not necessarily spiritual principles. They are prerequisites for spiritual principles. The Ten Commandments in the Western religions uh, definitely have some indication of moral principles. Some of them are spiritual principles that, you know, she'll have no other God other than God. I mean, obviously, that's a spiritual principle. But moral principles are things like honor your father and mother, uh, do not lie, do not commit adultery, and things like that. So these are extremely important for any leader, whether we're talking about a political leader, a spiritual leader, any sort of leader of society must follow these principles. Otherwise, people will follow them and society will become degraded, as we are experiencing to a great extent in America with someone's base. Base means the people who support them. It's really, we're at a low time in America. Rock bottom. Krishna is receiving education from Sandipani Muni as described by Sri Narada Muni as follows. In the beginning, Lord Brahma and others are like clouds of evaporated water from the great ocean of Krishna. In other words, Brahma first received the Vedic education from Krishna as the clouds receive water from the ocean. That Vedic education or instruction which was spoken by Brahma to the world was then reposed upon the mountain of Sandipani Muni. Sandipani Muni's instructions to Krishna are like a reservoir of water on the mountain which flows as a river and goes again to mix with the source, the ocean of Krishna. To be more clear, the idea is that Krishna actually cannot be instructed by anyone, just as the ocean does not receive water from any source but itself. It, all, it only appears that the rivers are pouring water into the ocean. So it is clear that Brahma received his education from Krishna and from Brahma via the disciple of succession that Svedi construction was distributed. Sandipani Muni is likened to the river which is flowing down again to that same original ocean of Krishna. Let me explain what that means. When Krishna left Vrindavan, okay, that was a horrible day. That was the worst day in the history of the universe. So, when he left Vrindavan, apart from that being the worst day for us, when Krishna left Vrindavan, he went to Mathura. Of course, he did several things first in Mathura, like killing his uncle, which is a pretty good idea. <laughs> his uncle was a demon, Kamsa. And shortly after that, he was sent by Vasudev and Devaki to the ashram of Sandipani Muni, who was his guru. 
and he spent 64 days in the ashram of Sandipani Muni. Each day he learns a particular subject fully, 100%. And actually, whatever he learned ultimately came from him, which is being described here. And he perfected his knowledge in 64 days. And after those 64 days, he gave his guru, Sanitani Muni, a fantastic gift, Guru Dakshin. He brought his guru's son back to life. Wow. To have a disciple like that would be great. Anyway, the Siddhas, the inhabitants of Siddha Loka, well, all are born with fully developed mystic powers. And the Charanas, the inhabitants of a similar planet, pray to Krishna as follows. My Lord Govinda, the goddess of learning, is decorated with 14 kinds of educational ornaments. Her intelligence is all-pervading within the four departments of the Vedas. Her attention is always on the law books given by great sages like Manu. And she is apparelled in six kinds of expert knowledge, namely Vedic evidence, grammar, astrology, rhetoric, vocabulary, and logic. Her constant friends are the supplements of the Vedas, the Puranas, and she is decorated with the final conclusion of all education. And now she has acquired an opportunity to sit with you as a class friend in school, and she is now engaged in your service. <laughs> Very interesting. Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, does not require any education but he gives a chance to the goddess of learning to serve him. Being self-sufficient, Krishna does not require the service of any living entity, although he has many devotees. It is because Krishna is so kind and merciful that he gives everyone the opportunity to serve him, as though he required the service of his devotees. Prabhupada said one time when he was questioned, why didn't Lord Chaitanya spread the Krishna consciousness movement? all over the world. And Prabhupada indicated that Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu wanted to give that opportunity to him, to Prabhupada. <laughs> so Krishna loves to glorify his devotees, and devotees love to glorify Krishna. Regarding his moral principles, it is stated in Srimad Bhagavatam that as Krishna is ruling over Vrindavan and is death personified to the thieves, and is pleasing bliss to the pious, as the most beautiful Cupid to the young girls and the most munificent personality to the poor men. He is as refreshing as the full moon to his friends and to his opponents. He is the annihilating fire generated from Lord Shiva. Krishna is therefore the most perfect moralist in his reciprocal dealings with different kinds of persons. When he is death personified to the thieves, it is not that he is without moral principles or that he is cruel, he is still kind. But to punish thieves, because to punish thieves with death is to exhibit the highest quality of moral principles. In Bhagavad Gita also, Krishna says that he deals with different kinds of persons according to their dealings with him. Anybody remember that verse? As people reciprocate with me, I reciprocate with them. Everyone follows my path in all respects. I am equal. In other words, Samoham Sabadu Nama Dinapriha. Krishna's dealings with devotees and non devotees, although different, are equally good. Because Krishna is all good, his dealings with everyone are always good. In other words, you get what you need, you get what you deserve. Oh my god. I actually deserve to have a material body. But yes, I deserve it. Highly intelligent. A man is called intelligent if he has a sharp memory and fine discretion. Discretion means the ability to ascertain which is the right course of action or who is right and who is wrong or what is more perfect, what is knowledge, what is ignorance. As far as Krishna's memory is concerned, it is said that when he was studying the school of Sandapani Muni in uh, Avantipura, that's near Ujjain, he showed such a sharp memory that at once taking instructions from the teacher, he immediately became perfect in any subject. Actually, his going to the school of Sandipani Muni was to show the people of the world that however great or ingenious one may be, he must go to higher authorities for general education. 
However great one may be, he must accept the teacher or spiritual master. Krishna's fine discretion was exhibited when he was fighting with the untouchable king who attacked the city of Mathura. According to the Vedic rites, those who are untouchable are not to be touched by the Kshatriya kings, not even for killing. Therefore, when the untouchable king sees the city of Mathura, Krishna did not think it wise to kill him directly with his own hands. Still, the king had to be killed, and therefore Krishna decided with fine discretion that he would flee from the battlefield so that the untouchable king would chase them. Uh, he could then lead the king uh, to the mountain where Muchukunda was lying asleep. Muchukunda received a benediction from Kartikeya to the effect that when he awoke from his sleep, whomever he might see would at once be burnt into ashes. Therefore, Krishna thought it wise to leave the untouchable king to that cave so that the king's presence would awaken Muchukunda and he would at once be burnt to ashes. So that's a very interesting story in the 10th canto. Shema Bhagavad told me. The untouchable king was named Kalyavana. Okay. Kalyavana. So anyway, Yavana. So what happened is this king challenged Krishna, and Krishna, instead of fighting with him, just ran away. Uh, of course, this is another instance of Ranshor, Krishna, who actually runs away from the battle. He ran away and ran into a cave. And in that cave was Muchukunda, as described above, sleeping. Now, Muchukunda was sleeping because previously he had fought for the demigods, and he had pleased the demigods. And, but he was tired, you know, after fighting for a long time, probably eons. Uh, he was pretty tired and exhausted. So he asked the demigods for benediction, especially Kartikeya, that whoever woke him up would be burnt to ashes. So, therefore, he was sleeping in the cave. And so Krishna very nicely went into that cave and hid, and I guess he covered the king, which we couldn't have been talking about right now, with his own shawl or blanket. So it appeared that it was Krishna sleeping. So what happened is Kalyavana, the rascal, the Yavana, the low-class king, uh, untouchable, went into the cave and he thought, oh, Krishna's hiding under the blanket or he's sleeping. So he went and he kicked who he thought was Krishna. And when he kicked him, Muchukunda woke up, opened his eyes, and boom! Instantaneous cremation without taking someone to the crematorium. And then Muchukunda offered prayers to Krishna. Nice chapter uh, in the Krishna book. 13. A person is called a genius when he can refute any kind of opposing element with newer and newer arguments. In this connection, there's a statement in the Pajavali which contains the following conversation between Krishna and Radha. One morning, when Krishna came to Radha, Radha asked him, My dear Keshava, where is your vasa at present? The Sanskrit word vasa has three meanings. One meaning is residence. One meaning is fragrance. Another meaning is dress. Actually, Radharani inquired from Krishna, Where's your dress? But Krishna took the meaning as residence. And he replied to Radharani, this is actually very romantic, My dear captivated one, at the present moment, my residence is in your beautiful eyes. Krishna's the greatest romantic person. To this, Radharani replied, My dear cunning boy, I did not ask you about your residence. I inquired about your dress. Krishna then took the meaning of vasa as fragrance and said, my dear fortunate one, I have just assumed this fragrance in order to be associated with your body. A no romantic statement. Uh, Sri Mati Radharani. <laughs> so you see, like, there's uh, certain words that can mean something different and something different either by the way they're pronounced or by the context. In every language, it's like that. Sri Mati Radharani again inquired from Krishna, where did you pass your night? The exact Sanskrit word used in this connection was yaminya mushitaha. Yaminya means at night, and mushitaha means to pass. Krishna, however, divided the word yaminya mushitaha into two separate words, namely yaminya and mushitaha. 
By dividing the word into two, it came out to mean that he was kidnapped by Yamini, or night. <laughs> Krishna therefore replied to Radharani, My dear Radharani, is it possible that night can kidnap me? In this way, he was answering all the questions of Radharani so cunningly that he gladdened this dearest of the gopis. In other words, he was entertaining her, and this is part of the loving exchange between Radha and Krishna. Some of these stories here are so, I mean, they're all wonderful, but some of them are just like, wow. One who can talk and dress himself very, he has stimulated my particular ecstasy. One who can talk and dress himself very artistically is called Vibhogya. This exemplary characteristic was visible in the personality of Sri Krishna. It is spoken of by Radharani as follows. My dear friend, just see how Krishna has nicely composed songs and how he dances and speaks funny words and plays on his flute wearing such nice garlands. He has dressed himself in such an enchanting way as though he had defeated all kinds of players at the chessboard. He lives wonderfully at the topmost height of artistic craftsmanship. The next one is clever. A person who can perform various types of work at once is called clever. It's called multitasking. In this connection, one of the gopis said, my dear friends, just see the clever activities of Sri Krishna. He has composed nice songs about the coward boys and is pleasing the cows. By the movement of his eyes, he is pleasing the gopis. And at the same time, he is fighting with demons like Urgishtasura. In this way, he is sitting with different living entities in different ways, and he is thoroughly enjoying the situation. 16. Expert. Any person who can quickly execute a very difficult task is called expert. About the expertise of Krishna, there is a statement in the 10th canto, 59th chapter, verse 17 of Srimad Bhagavatam, wherein Sukadeva Goswami tells Maharaj Pariksit, O best of the Kurus, Sri Krishna cut to pieces all the different weapons used by the different fighters. Hmm. Formerly, fighting was done by releasing different kinds of arrows. One party would release a certain arrow, and the other party had to defeat it by counteracting it with another arrow. For example, one party might release an arrow which would cause water to pour from the sky. And to counteract this, the opposing party would have to release an arrow which could immediately turn the water into clouds. So from this statement, it appears that Krishna was very expert in counteracting the enemy's arrows. Similarly, at the Rasa dance, each and every gopi requested that Krishna individually become her partner and Krishna immediately expanded himself into so many Krishnas in order to be coupled with each and every gopi. The result was that each gopi found Krishna by her side. Grateful. Now this is good for us. Any person who is conscious of his friend's beneficent activities and never forgets his service is called grateful. In the Mahabharata, Krishna says, when I was away from Draupadi, she cried with the words, Hey, Govinda, this call for me has put me in her debt. And that indebtedness is gradually increasing in my heart. This statement by Krishna gives evidence of how one can please the Supreme Lord simply by addressing him. Hey, Krishna. Hey, Govinda. Just by addressing him in this way. And of course, one time when Draupadi cried out with the words, Hey Govinda, uh, she was being attacked by these rascals, the Kurus, who were attempting to disrobe her in the assembly house, right in front of all the different elderly members of the family. And they were trying to grab her cloth or sorry from her. And particularly one entity named Dusha Shana, a bad guy, was doing this. And he was pulling. And she was trying to hold on. And he was like very strong. She's a girl, you know, not that strong. So she was holding on. He was pulling. And she couldn't hold on any longer. She thought, I can't do this by myself. I can't defend myself. 
And she thought, the only way I can actually be saved is to cry out for Krishna. Hey, Govinda. Hey, Krishna. And then what happened is Krishna supplied unlimited cloth. So this Dusha Shan, the bad guy, he kept pulling the cloth, pulling the cloth, pulling the cloth, and the whole place became filled with cloth, and eventually he gave up. Krishna protected his devotee. The Maha Mantra, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, is also simply an address to the Lord and his energy. So to anyone who is constantly engaged in addressing the Lord and his energy, we can imagine how much the Supreme Lord is obliged. It is impossible for the Lord to ever forget such a devotee. It is clearly stated in this verse that anyone who addresses the Lord immediately attracts the attention of the Lord who always remains obliged to him. So obviously when we hear the words, Hey Govinda, that's actually a cry out to the Lord. It's definitely, I mean, there's no way of interpreting it any other way. So in the same way, when we chant Hari or Krishna, they're both in the Vakada form. Vakada means to cry out rather than the nominative form. Nominative means name. So Krishnas to Bhagavan Swayam, that's in the nominative. When you say Krishna is the original Supreme Personality of God, it means Krishna is his name. But when you say Krishna, that's crying out automatically in the name of the Lord. There's built in the intention, the mood to cry out to Krishna. And of course, Hare is the vocative of uh, energy of the Lord. Oh, energy of the Lord. Oh, Radharani, basically. Crying out to Radharani. Oh, Radharani. Oh, Krishna. And Rama. Oh, Rama. It's not Rama. It's Rama. <laughs> We're crying out, Oh, Radharaman, oh, Krishna, help. And so the Hare Krishna mantra can be chanted in that mood. Ainanda Tanuja Kinkaram, like that verse of the Shikshashita. Another instance of Krishna's feeling of obligation is stated in connection with his dealings with Jambavan. When the Lord was present as Lord Ramachandra, Jambavan, the great king of the monkeys, rendered very faithful service to him. When the Lord again appeared as Lord Krishna, he married Jambavan's daughter and paid him all respect that is usually given to superiors. Any honest person is obliged to his friend if some service had been rendered unto him. Since Krishna is a supreme honest personality, how can he forget an obligation to his servant? So, Jambavan was actually, he's Riksha Raj, he's like the king of the bears. And I guess prophets say, you know, bears and monkeys or whatever. So, but literally in the uh, Ramayana, he's described as the king of the bears. He's not a bear because his daughter would be unbearable if she was the daughter of a bear. <laughs> In other words, can you imagine Krishna marrying someone who looked like a bear with hair all over her face and all over her body? I mean, chewy. Krishna would never do that. Anyway, so he was basically big form, like, you know, sometimes you see a man who looks like almost like a bear because he's so strong. And his daughter was there, and he was in charge of the bears. And he uh, helped Lord Ramchandra. Now, he wanted his daughter to marry Lord Ramchandra, but Lord Ramchandra couldn't marry her because, why? Because he had taken a vow, Ikopatni Vrata. He was only going to marry one wife. That was Sita Devi. Okay. So she had to wait a long time, long time to marry. So what next, when Krishna appeared as Krishna, which is, Basically, a long time after Lord Ramchandra, uh, Krishna was looking for the Shimantaka jewel, which had been taken by a tiger, then killed Prashena, who was Satyajit's, I'm not going to tell the whole story, but was Satyajit's brother. Anyway, and Jambavan had killed the tiger and given the jewel to his daughter, the Shimantaka jewel. And so Krishna went in the cave and he found the jewel and Jamalan's daughter, uh, Jamalati, 
cried out, and Jambavant came and fought him for something like 28 days. You know, a very chivalrous fight. And then he realized that Krishna was Ram. And he apologized, and he gave his daughter to Krishna. And she was one of the 16,108 wives of Krishna. That's no problem for Krishna, because there were 16,108 palaces. And in each and every palace, Krishna was doing something different with each and every one of his family members. And Krishna divided himself like that. That's pretty nice. So if you can do that, you can have 16,108 wives. 18. Determined. Any person who observes regulated principles and fulfills his promises by practical activity is called determined. As far as the Lord's determination is concerned, uh, there's an example in his dealings in the Hari Vongsha. This is in connection with Lord Krishna's fighting the King of Heaven, Indra, who was forcibly deprived of the Parajata flower. Parajata is a kind of lotus flower grown on the heavenly planets. One such Obama, one of Krishna's queens, wanted that lotus flower, and Krishna promised to deliver it. But Indra refused to part with his Parajata flower. Therefore, there was a great fight with Krishna and the Pandavas on one side and all the demigods on the other. Ultimately, Krishna defeated all of them and took the Parajata flower, which he presented to his queen. So in regard to that occurrence, Krishna told Narada Muni, my dear great sage of the demigods, now you can declare to the devotees in general, to the non-devotees in particular, that in this matter of taking the Parijata flower, all the demigods, the Gandharvas, the Nagas, the demon Rakshasas, the Yakshas, the Panagas tried to defeat me, but none could make me break my promise to my queen. It's an interesting story. It's also in the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. How Krishna first went and did some service for the demigods. And he got the earrings of Aditi back, which were stolen. And he brought these earrings back, and the demigods were very happy. And Krishna said, Can you give me a paradox tree? And they said, No way, Krishna, you can't have it. Krishna had previously given Rukmini a Parajata flower. And that's why Satyabhama was demanding a whole tree. And then Krishna had to fight the demigods, and eventually Krishna defeated the demigods and the demons and the Rakshasas and everybody else and got the Parajata tree. There's another promise by Krishna in Bhagavad Gita to the effect that his devotee will never be vanquished. So a sincere devotee who is always engaged in the transcendental loving service of the Lord should know for certain that Krishna will never break his promise. He will always protect his devotees in every circumstance. Krishna showed how he fulfills his promise by delivering the powers of the flower to Satyavama, by saving Draupadi from being insulted, and by freeing Arjuna from the attacks of all enemies. Actually, there's more to that story that I didn't tell a second ago uh, about a promise to Satyavama. Let's go back and talk about the demon that Krishna killed. Okay, the demon that Krishna killed, uh-oh, was Krishna's son uh, that he had from a previous incarnation as Lord Bore. And that son was had with a relationship with Bhumi, the earth planet. Because when Lord Bore touched the earth planet with his tusks, he impregnated the earth. Because Krishna can do anything with any part of his body that he wants. Anyway, and so there's a little kid born. His name was Boma. And Boma got really polluted by bad association. He became a demon. Therefore, they changed his name to Boma the demon, Bomasura. And Bomasura kidnapped all these princesses, as well as stealing the, uh, hmm, the earrings from Aditi. And Krishna had to come and save the scene. Now, but Krishna had a problem. Because previously, when Boma was born, his mother actually made Krishna promise not to kill Bomasura unless she gave permission. Okay, so Krishna was caught between a rock and a hard place, so to speak. But Krishna is very intelligent. He knows how to fulfill 
his promises, so he promised not to kill Bomasura. Yet we know in the story he did kill Bomasura. He promised not to kill Bomasura until he got permission from uh, from from the earth personified, Bumi. Okay, so how did he get permission? Well, he knew that Bumi is an expansion of Satchabama, non-different from Satchabama, so when he went to kill Bomasura, he brought Satchabama with him. And while they were both being attacked by Bomasura, Satchabama said, kill him already. And Krishna basically said, thank you. <laughs> thank you for giving me permission. Let's see if we can finish with this. Yeah, we just for one more paragraph and we'll finish for today. The promise of Krishna that his devotees had never vanquished, had also previously been admitted by Arth Indra when he was defeated in the Govardhan Leela. That's when Krishna left the Govardhan Hill and protected the residents of Vrindavan. When Krishna stopped the villagers of Braja Vrindavana from worshipping Indra, Indra became angry and therefore inundated Vrindavan with continuous rain. Krishna, however, protected all of the citizens and animals of Vrindavan by lifting Govardhan Hill, which served as an umbrella. After the incident, after the incident was over, Indra surrendered to Krishna with many prayers in which he admitted, by your lifting Govardhan Hill and protecting the citizens of Vrindavana, you have kept your promise that your devotees are never to be vanquished. Tadibo. Okay. So we will take some questions now. After hearing about many of the qualities of Sri Krishna and feeling ecstasy, by hearing about these qualities. Okay. Who has some questions? Questions, arguments, problems? No one? I hear someone's beginning to speak. Uh oh, it sounds like Pernesha. Is it? Who, who is speaking? I hear someone. Gurudev, I have a question. This is Krishna Priya. Oh, Krishna Priya. Okay, so, so what's your question? Can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Okay, my question is, like we just ended hearing about Lord Indra, and we know that after he had um, caused so much difficulty, to the residents of Vrindavan that he offered so many beautiful prayers and he realized the position of Lord Krishna. But then yeah. we see on his later past, you know, Krishna's later pastimes when he's in Dwarka and, and he goes to steal the Parijata flower for Satchabama, that Indra becomes all upset again. And, and and at this time he must he knows the position of Krishna. So can you speak on that? That's easy to understand. That's Avartam Gyana Maitena Gyani Nandishravayana Kambaru Pena Kondira Dishrena Lenacha. But because of lust, because of anger, because of greed, one's intelligence becomes covered. You know, so sometimes we know better. I mean, even any of us, you know, sometimes we know better that we shouldn't do something, we should do something, and we don't do it because either laziness or greed or lust. I mean, how many times the people, all right, let's give an example. Someone has diabetes, and they know they're not supposed to eat sugar, but they do it anyway. I mean, it's incredible. Someone's smoking a cigarette. I mean, I just heard about some big political commentator in the United States who has, I think, the, one of the biggest radio shows in the country. Of course, he's a, he's a Republican. Anyway. <laughs> and he has terminal lung cancer. He was always bragging about, you know, smoking the latest uh, cigar and everything like that. Or people who have, uh, have suffered, like, lung cancer or throat cancer, and they have a tracheotomy and they have a hole in their throat and because they're smoking and then they put the cigarette up to the hole in their smoke in their throat because i have one question though Gurdjie. but yeah. here you have someone who had you know the direct darshan of krishna in vrindavan yeah 
So what, lust is so strong, anger is so strong that it can do that to you. I mean, people have direct darshan of their body having cancer, and they still do it, don't they? Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's incredible. You know it's killing you, you know, but you're just like forced to act. Kama Asia, Krota Asia, Rajaguna Samudbhava. This is the description of Krishna and the Gita. Right? What is one forced to act as if, you know, what, what is if you're by force? Is lust only born of his uh, contact with the modes of passion and ignorance is later transformed into wrath. So it's like that, you know, when we get angry, we forget about everything. So Indra's not immune from that. And Indra has. I mean, look at all the problems Lindra has had with lust. Yet he's still, I mean, maybe he's learned his lesson by now. But, you know, he had his eyes all over his body because of that. He uh, got cursed to become uh, a eunuch yes. because of that at one time. Yes, yes. Kids, right, isn't it? Yeah, he's always getting in trouble. Yeah, he's continually getting in trouble. And that's, that's a story for us to learn from, that if one is controlled by one's lower nature, you can have direct uh, experience with the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and yet it won't, won't help you at all. You'll just like oppose him, and then that's it. So one has to <laughs> conquer the lower nature with the higher nature. In other words, tolerate the pushings of uh, was the tongue, belly, genitals, mind, anger, and words. Vacho vegam, manasa, krota vegam, jiva vegam, udara, pashta vegam. Uh, that's the only solution. And, you know, there's people that have any plans to get to it. I mean, you have, you have Brahash, you have uh, Soma, the moon god, yeah. who stole his guru's wife and had a kid with his guru's wife. And that's in the heavenly planets. Can you imagine that? Could you imagine a disciple doing that with his guru's wife? Horrendous. That's why it's good for gurus not to be married in Kali Yuga because. Because <laughs> <laughs> they, unless they want to marry someone ugly, then it's all right. So anyway, so. So Gurudev, from this we can understand that one can have the direct association of their spiritual master. One can have the direct association of, of deity seva. But yeah. if not careful, again, they can become a mouse. Yeah, look at Bard Maharaj. He had direct bhava. You know, yeah. He was an ecstasy. And then he became a deer, with the speaker of becoming a mouse. So, yeah, there's that danger. I mean, it's lust can overcome. Every time jnana maintaina jnana no nature vairana, kama rupena kondiya dushbrena lenacha. One's pure consciousness becomes, becomes covered by lust, which is one's eternal enemy, uh, and burns like fire, according to this verse. I mean, that's why we have to keep good association all the time, because, you know, we, any one of the senses upon which we meditate or concentrate can steal away the mind of even of the most intelligent person. Uh, Balavan Indriya Grama, Vidvan Eva Karshati. That the senses are so strong, they can just like take you away in a second and you forget about your spiritual life, you forget about your dharma, you forget about your morals. It is extremely dangerous, this world like that. Okay. Thank you, Gurdjieff. Let's be careful. So, anyway, thank you for the question. So, who else has a question? Hare Krishna, Guru Dev. Yeah, Rishikesh. Yes. Uh, so on the same lines, Guru Dev, um, I had a question about Lord Brahma. Uh, when yeah. he got realization of Brahma Samhita, uh, yeah. he was trans yeah. literally transported to Golok Vrindavan. And he actually yeah. saw Krishna. And he, yeah. he documented everything in Brahma Samhita. However, he was still bewildered and stole the, the cows and cow, boys, you know, uh, singing, how can this be a god? How is well, that, that possible? Well, that's that's explained by the Acharya that, that that was Yoga Maya. That was Yoga Maya. Uh, you know, in other words, so Krishna can enact his pastimes 
he arranged, just like he arranged for Arjuna to be bewildered, so he arranged for Lord Brahma to be bewildered. And, uh, you know, basically Lord Brahma wanted to see the fun. It was like a playful thing almost, too. It wasn't, Lord Brahma wasn't hateful. Like, it wasn't like Indra. Indra was actually hateful. You have to understand the difference. Indra was upset because he wasn't being worshipped. Lord Brahma basically just wanted to test him and have fun. And it was, Krishna, it was Krishna's pastimes. And uh, anyway, so that was a completely different scenario than Indra trying to kill the residents of Vrindavan. Good question. Okay, another question from our many people. I have a question, Gurudev. Yeah. I've actually yep. been wondering this for a long time. So we don't put a number on the gopis in Vrindavan. We say there's unlimited gopis. So why is there a number of wives? Why is there only 16,108? Why aren't there unlimited? Does that mean that most of the gopis didn't get to marry Krishna? <laughs> That's actually interesting. Well, the gopis who are... Uh, Shakti Tattva, they expanded as the queens. But the other ones didn't necessarily. You understand? So it's not that all... The majority of gopis were, were Jiva Tattva. Or Jiva Tattva. Not just were, or Jiva Tattva. And the uh, primary gopis are actually Shakti. Like Radharani is not Jiva Tattva. Vishaka, Lalitha, like that, they're not Jiva Tattva. They're actually Shaktis of the Supreme Personality of God. So they're in a different category. So they expand as the queens in Dwarka. Whereas, let's say if you become a gopi, <laughs> actually, it's interesting. We, we just read that story about, who was that, Chandrakanti, who danced all night to get Krishna's favor? From the Shrimad and that was in the Nectar Devotion. So anyway, so if you become a gopi, it's that not that you will expand as uh, a queen of Vrindavan, unless that's what you want to be. But basically, you'll just be satisfied to be a, a queen in Dwarka, sorry. But you'll be satisfied to be in Vrindavan. So these queens, they were actually expansions from the gopis. And so it's not that every gopi expanded. That's the answer to that. So do any jivas get to marry Krishna and be his wife? Uh, probably. I mean, I don't know. That question I can't answer. Mm. I mean, if you want to, go to Dwarka. Okay. Then you just write to me as I'm in Vrindavan. You can just send me some notes. <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you, can send a, you can send a note through Udava or Balaram when they come to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I, I'm going to Braj, not to work with so. <laughs> too, too much awe and reverence in Dwarka. All right. Anyway, so some of these questions I don't find answers to in the Shastras. So I, I have to be honest about it. That Yes, if you want to be like that, it's fine to be Krishna's wife, and then it's, di it's a different mood. It's really a different mood in Dwarka, where it's a mood of, you know, it's more mood of awe and reverence, you know, the Varnashram and everything like that there. And people, people are not violating ordinary moral principles in Dwarka. Everything is done like prim and proper. So, okay. See, what she went offline. Oh, there she still is. So I'll, I'll see you in where I'll see. I don't know where. where I'll see you, but anyway. So, any other quick questions? Oh, hi, Krishna Gurudev. Um, it's me, Divinita Lila here. Divinita Lila. Hare Krishna Gurudev. Um, Gurudev, it's a question that uh, that we read yesterday. 
so when you were listing the question uh, the qualities of krishna so there is a there is a statement which is says that krishna also possesses five other qualities which are manifest in the body of narayan right and they are listed as follows so one of them is he is the original source of all incarnations so you know krishna is the original source of incarnation but how yes. is that manifest in well, Krishna, Krishna manifests, first of all, there's the Chaturvyuha expansion, right? Vasudev, yeah. there's Krishna, Balaram, um, then uh, Prajuna, Niruda, and then you have Vasudev, San So, so uh, all the incarnations come in this material world. When you're talking about Krishna appearing in this material world, they come through the Mahavishnu except for Krishna Balaram. Of course, Mahavishnu is non-different from Krishna. I mean, Advaita, Chuta, Nadi, Rananta, Rupa, Madhyam, Purana, Purusham, Navyavanam, but he's Krishna in a different mood. So in that sense, you can say all the incarnations come from Krishna and, all, and, they, and they come from Vishnu too. So when Krishna manifests in this world, the uh, incarnations come through Mahavishnu and Garbhadakshaya Vishnu, actually. Uh, but when Krishna personally comes, he comes directly. But the other incarnations come through indirectly from Krishna. Does that explain that? Yeah. 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 And you're going back, you're going back to Navadweet Mayapur. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Guru. <laughs> thank you. Shambhaka will be in Dwarka, I'll be in Vrindavan. Oh, well, no, okay. well She'll go back. I'll, be, I'll try to be in Vrindavan too, Gurudev, if you bless. Okay. Shambhaka will go back to Vrindavan too, don't worry. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Thank you, Gurudev. <laughs> All right, uh, one more question from anybody. No questions. Everyone's shy here. Okay. Uh-oh. Who is that? No other questions. All right. I just want to make an announcement. Anyway, so anyway, you all know the day of the Vyas Puja. For those of you in Fiji, Australia, New Zealand, you know the time that'll be on Tuesday. For those of you who and also Europe, and also uh, India. You know the time it'll be on Tuesday. Just check out on my WhatsApp group. If you're not on the WhatsApp group, email me your number and I'll add you to the WhatsApp group. And for those of you in North America, it's uh, on Sunday, four o'clock East Coast time. And if you want to join from Europe, it'll either be nine o'clock PM uh in the uk or 10 o'clock p.m in the rest of europe anyway just if you're interested in the timing what's going to happen and everything like that just write me on email please not on the chat window here and uh ooh, someone sent me a whole bunch of stuff here Anyway, I'll read that later. So uh, just email me and I'll add you to the WhatsApp group so you can find out the time exactly. It's going to be a little complicated. Okay, thank you all for joining us. And we'll see everybody tomorrow night or tomorrow morning, depending on where you are. Same time, same station. All glories to his divine grace. Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada, Ki Jai.